coming up on Network Africa. The United Nations says more than 20,000 Ethiopians have fled to Sudan as the Tigrayan crisis escalates. Peace talks in Libya pause with no naming of a new government. Class doctors in Kenya vent their anger after a number of colleagues die from coronavirus. Hello and welcome to the program today. I'm Layo Adegoki. We begin this week with stories and happenings that made headlines over the weekend. On Sunday, the 12-day conflict between Ethiopia's government and forces in the country's Tigray region escalated, with the Tigrayan forces firing rockets across the border into neighboring Eritrea. This follows claims that Ethiopian soldiers were using an Eritrean airport to attack Tigray. However, Ethiopia's Prime Minister denied the accusations. The attacks mark a major uptick in the conflict which has displaced thousands of civilians. Many have crossed into Sudan and refugees tell stories of artillery attacks and shooting in the streets, with fighting spilling over into neighboring Amhara state. Still on Sunday, President Abdul Majid Taboon finished his treatment for COVID-19, but his presidency says he will undergo follow-up checks. The 75-year-old was flown to a German hospital 19 days ago after he tested positive for the coronavirus. President Taboon was elected last December after more than a year of mass protests that toppled his predecessor, Abdul Aziz Bouteflika. On Saturday, Egypt showcased more than 100 coffins dating back 2,500 years, the latest and largest find this year in the vast burial ground of the Saqqara necropolis. This discovery, number one, because of the number of the coffins that we found, the number of the coffins that we found, we took about more than 100 coffins, which is something really very important. Number two, the standard of living, high-ranked people, that's why the condition of the coffins, not like the one that we did announce October 3rd with those 59 coffins. No, this time, most of them, they were a little bit rich or richer than the other one, a little bit higher rank than the other one. The newly discovered coffins plus associated mummies and artifacts will go on display at the Grand Egyptian Museum, which is expected to open next year. To our main stories now, the United Nations is concerned about the growing number of Ethiopian refugees fleeing violence into Sudan. The UN Refugee Agency says more than 20,000 people have fled the conflict in northern Ethiopia, with local and UN agencies trying to assist the refugees, many of whom have been arriving in growing numbers with few possessions or provisions, some in boats and some swimming or wading through rivers. According to UNHCR's data, more than 12,500 crossed at Hamdayat and nearly 7,500 to the south at the al between November 7th and 14th. The situation is very bad, to put it mildly. The, um, there are about 15,000 people here right now who basically arrived over the last five days. Um, we are starting to provide assistance services with UNHCR, WFP, the Sudanese Red Cross, Muslim Aid, and other service providers. And you can see some start of an assistance uh, provision, but much more needs to be done. This is very close to the border. This is Hamdaya town. The community has been very generous. What we see here as well is that the Hamdaya community has provided support to the refugees. They've provided a local tent. You see that in the background. Uh, they have given food and they have given other items. So this is a, uh, also a big thank you to the local community here who are very burdened with this. That's it. 
Well, Libya's political peace talks ended on Sunday without the naming of a new transitional government and interim presidency council. The UN's Libya envoy, Stephanie Williams, said no names were discussed during the week-long meeting. Now, during the talks involving delegates from rival sides, a preliminary agreement to a roadmap for elections was reached. The talks are being held in neighboring Tunisia. Consensus on a road, road map towards elections with a clear date of the 24th of December 2021, which is Libya's Independence Day, as you know. They came together and they displayed a very strong national spirit. As I said in my closing remarks tonight to them, 10 years of conflict cannot be resolved in one week. But, to quote one of the senior participants in the dialogue, actual reconciliation was taking place in the room amongst the participants who have been willing to sit down and to attempt to resolve their differences. The doctors' union in Kenya has given the government the statutory 21-day notice of a strike after it said that 10 of its members had died from coronavirus. Four doctors died last week alone, all in a 24-hour period, although it is unclear if they had contact with coronavirus patients. Now, the doctors accused the government of exposing them to the virus, saying they would not call off the planned strike until all their demands are met. Kenya has so far confirmed more than 70,200 coronavirus cases and 1,269 deaths. Meanwhile, Kenya's education minister, George Magoha, has announced that all students will return to school on the 4th of January come 2021. Currently, only final year students are in school, while some in places, lessons have continued online for students in other years. Like many other countries, the school calendar was disrupted disrupted by coronavirus and at the onset of the pandemic the ministry of education scrapped the entire 2020 academic year but it later announced that finalists will be allowed to resume face-to-face -face lessons well let's speak now and get more on the situation in kenya from a journalist joining us now abby agina joins us now from nairobi thank you so much abby for speaking to us let's begin with the announcement by the education ministry what has been the reception to this from students teachers and even their parents well thank you so much for having me on the program well this comes as a relief to many of the education fraternity stakeholders. Uh, they have welcomed this new development, indicating that uh, it was about time for the country to go back to full-scale learning in, the, in Kenya. And uh, from the parents' side of things, uh, there are still concerns around the safety of the learners, which the government has said um, so far since October this year, they did a partial reopening of schools, which has so far been, uh, has actually gone unhinged. So far, we do understand that um, the government has already uh, made uh, uh, quite a number of uh, reforms touching on uh, ensuring there will be social distancing in the schools. By this, uh, they've been able to procure for additional desks for public schools. Over and above that, they've also made a provision to have uh, sanitizers and washing stations in most of the schools. So all this is in readiness for the reopening come January the 4th, 2021. It's still too early to see what more of the parents will say about this because it continues to be an evolving situation. So it's back to school for so many students. And what are the government's plan? What, what's the government plan to make up for the disruption caused by the virus to their education? Well, clearly, this uh, pandemic has not only affected the economy, it has dented the education sector significantly. And uh, part of the reasons why the government is keen to have the schools reopen is the fact that there is a backlog of learners. Traditionally, in Kenya, 
We have two major examinations that happen in the country. One of the examinations is the secondary level, and the other one is for the primary level. So by this, uh, when you look at the new proposed calendar by the Ministry of Education, the learners are set to resume schooling uh, from January the 4th. And uh, from this, uh, the timetable further uh, actually uh, breaks it down where we'll have the young learners who will be in school from the month of January all the way to the month of March. Then they'll go for a seven weeks holiday. This uh, time period has been very critical. The government is hoping to ensure during that seven week period, the candidate students and the pupils from primary school level to those in secondary school level, they'll be able to conduct their exams during that time frame. The exams will be marked and they'll be able to get the results so that they can clear the batch of students that were meant to sit for their end of year examinations in this particular year. So this will see next year the candidates be, be able to sit for the examinations. Thereafter, after the seven weeks holiday, schools will uh, reopen again where we'll have uh, another time frame going all the way up to October, which will see them close for one more uh, week for holiday. Thereafter, they will resume uh, in the month of October and go all the way to December. And that will enable for the learners who will be going to the candidate years to sit for the exams in 2021, as well as uh, for the candidates in uh, primary school. So quite a very ambitious uh, timetable for the school uh, education sector. It is still unclear how will it be implemented, will it be practical. Um, some some uh, analysts have also come out saying uh, it is very um, squeezed and uh, it, it remains to be seen how the government will manage expectations from the various uh, private schools as well as the public schools. Indeed, those students have their work cut out for them. Now, let's talk about the health workers. They are threatening a strike and they're accusing the government of exposing them to COVID-19. What, what exactly do they mean with this accusation? Well, the health professionals are grieving at this moment. Uh, they are claiming that the government is yet to disburse close to 6.2 billion shillings that is meant to cater for the procurement of uh, private protective equipment, the PPEs. That is one of the critical issues that has been tabled by the health workers. The other issue that they want the government to address is the issue of insurance for the health workers who on many occasions, if they're diagnosed with uh, COVID-19, they have to foot the bill from their pockets. The government had indicated that they'll be rolling out an insurance scheme for health workers and earlier today, the Minister for Health, that is uh, Mr. Mutahi Kagwe, did disclose that uh, they have been able to finalize on all the plans that were set for this insurance scheme to be rolled out. And beginning tomorrow, the government has assured health workers that the insurance uh, will be in place. Of course, uh, this is a subject uh, to seeing it being implemented come tomorrow. And uh, finally, the other critical issue that the medical workers have been raising is, the, of course, the, the thorny issue of their, their pending payments when it comes to allowances, uh, when, it, when, when you look at the, the major concerns they've been having over the years. So it will be very critical for the government to ensure that they meet the demands or else come the 6th of December, all public facilities will not have doctors, nurses attending to patients. So it will be a very, very, uh, a sl uh, it will be really a uh, defining moment for Kenya's health sector, even as the country battles the pandemic, where we are seeing the cases have been rising. We are now at about uh, 70,800 confirmed positive cases. And the second wave effects continue to uh, create a lot of uh, anxiety, even as the country tries to ensure that the measures put in place are continued to be abided by the citizens. All right, then. Thank you so much, Abby Agina, Kenyan journalist from Nairobi. Thank you so much for those updates. Thank you for having me. Still ahead on the program.
Thanks for staying with us. Eswatini Prime Minister Ambrose Demlini has tested positive for COVID-19. The Prime Minister on Sunday said he was self-isolating at home, adding that he was asymptomatic and was feeling well. All the Prime Minister's close contacts have since been tested and are also isolating. According to a statement from the Health Ministry, the country on Sunday tested 384 samples, out of which two were found to be positive. The total number of coronavirus cases in that place stands at 6,095, including 119 deaths. Now, in a bid to examine the impact of corruption on the development of small businesses in Africa, South Africa's Human Sciences Research Council, in collaboration with the Embassy of South Korea, has held a webinar to discuss solutions from an SME perspective. The webinar presented a case of South Korea's governance practices for economic growth, where the ambassador said prior prioritizing economic principles could help African small businesses. In a world where nations, economies and big businesses are collapsing under the twin challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic and never-ending corruption, how are small businesses even faring today? That was the focus of the discussions at the webinar. So they, they, they are an engine of uh, growth, uh, development and transformation and, and not paying uh, uh, but particular attention to them uh, would mean that uh, we are leaving a huge uh, segment of uh, our economic operators behind uh, with uh, very far-reaching uh, implications. There's actually some research um, which illustrates the relationship between corruption and, and SME growth in Africa. And that research highlighted that anytime there's even a one percentage point increase in corruption in, in a country, that leads to a 36% decline in SME growth, this growth being measured by sales and employment. Corruption locks SMEs out of the out of procurement markets, of course, when they cannot afford the bribes that may be, but that may be demanded. It also increases the cost of doing business when they have to pay to sub circumvent bureaucracy or to access government support services, when they have to pay to get the permits or certifications um, that may be required to access government contracts. Corruption also affects the record keeping by, by SMEs, by all co um, companies really, as they manipulate their accounts to hide the payment of bribes and um, facilitation fees. These inaccurate records will later affect the ability of SMEs to obtain grants, funding or private sector investment, affecting their ability, of course, to grow. From a South Korean perspective, the participants got to hear how corruption is being curbed and what difference the government strategy has made so, in that country. If, we, if I were to draw three key lessons uh, for Africa, uh, including South Africa, uh, that were the success factor of South Korea, I would say it was three things. So first is economic principles, second, human and social capital, and the third point, I think it's really important, it's relevant uh, to our discourse uh, today, is pr pr practicing stringent accountability. By accountability, uh, I don't mean only for uh, government officials, uh, politicians, bureaucrats. It should be throughout the spectrum of the whole society. SMEs represent about 90% of businesses and provide more than 50% employment worldwide and up to 40% of the gross domestic product in emerging economies. However, with the recent COVID-19 pandemic, 75% of SMEs are experiencing reductions in revenue and about 50% have closed their businesses for now. Participants from the webinar agreed that the fight against corruption is a priority as SMEs are a major contributor to economic development in any nation and will be vital in the quest for economic recovery post-COVID-19. Former President of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, has applied for Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zondo to recuse himself as the head of the commission investigating corruption during his presidency.
The inquiry, known as the Zondo Commission, was established to investigate the state capture scandal during Mr. Zuma's tenure as president. The scandal revolves around corruption allegations, which Mr. Zuma denies. Now, he first testified before the commission last year and was due to return to give further evidence, has previously said that the inquiry is biased, I beg your pardon, against him, claiming the probe is politically motivated and the evidence against him was part of a witch hunt. Mr. Zondo at some stage suggested the inquiry would subpoena the former president when he announced that he would no longer willingly present himself. Accusations of grafts dogged Mr. Zuma's presidency before he was forced to step down in 2018 in February. Now, lockdown restrictions in Somalia has hampered the country's efforts to contain swarms of desert locusts that are ravaging farmland across the country. This insect invasion is also threatening livelihoods in a country where many already go hungry. The coronavirus pandemic has exacerbated the crisis further by disrupting supply chains of pesticides and other equipment needed to fight them off. On the outskirts of Mogadishu, farmer Mohamed Yassin, with a rifle on his back, walks through a field and tries to wave away a swarm of yellow-colored locusts that have invaded his farm. Locusts have destroyed maize and beans in the farm and landed in the field around the homestead, and they ate all the grasses, turning the land into a desert. He says he wants the government to help because his land is being turned into a desert. We live in fields in the outskirts of Day now. We request the government helps us on fighting the locusts as they are turning land everywhere into a desert. Like neighboring Kenya and Ethiopia, Somalia has been battling swarms of desert locusts since late last year, but the war-ravaged country has struggled due to insecurity, remote locations and a lack of resources. According to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, the infestation has affected more than 1,000 square miles of land in Somalia and impacted the food security of at least 200,000 people. All Bangladeshi peacekeepers in South Sudan have been rewarded for their duty with the presentation of the United Nations Medal at a special ceremony in Juba. This comes as they prepare to return home to their family and friends after their year of service. The world's newest nation is struggling to recover after five years of civil war, which devastated its people and infrastructure. It's about trade from one place to another. And it's about peace, because when people can move from one area of South Sudan to another area of South Sudan and mix with other people, it brings about peace. It lowers suspicion. It builds trust. And that's what's important. With all these untiring efforts, Bangladesh has proved their dedication for the world peace. I firmly reiterate our commitment to the peacekeeping operation and ensure that Bangladeshi peacekeepers will put up their best for the greater interest of the world peace. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adegoki.